Amen. Brian, I have now turned on my mic, so that should help. It's the little things. I invite you this morning to hear from our Old Testament reading from the 17th chapter of the book of 1 Kings, beginning with verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go now to Zarephath which belongs to Sidon, and live there. For I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So Elijah set out and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel so that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son, and that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but first take me a little cake of it. Make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of meal will not be emptied and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she as well as her and her household ate for many days. The jar of meal was not emptied, neither did the jug of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. His illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. She then said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. But he said to her, Give me your son. He took him from her bosom, carried him up, into the upper chamber where he was lodging and laid him on his own bed. And he cried out to the Lord, O Lord, my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I am staying by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried out to the Lord, O Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. The Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. The life of the child came into him again. And he revived. Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper chamber into the house, and gave him to his mother. And then Elijah said, See, your son is alive. So the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. God, thank you for the gift of your word. May it continue to challenge us, to probe us at the greatest depths in our souls. May it strengthen us and awaken us as well. And may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts this day be pleasing and acceptable to you, our Lord, our Rock, our Redeemer. Amen. Remember when last summer, after nine years and three billion miles, NASA's New Horizons spacecraft zipped right on past Pluto. New Horizons, if you remember, is a spacecraft about the size of a washing machine and basically powered by the equivalent of a light bulb that was launched in 2006. And people with ridiculous brain power have charted charted its course, directed and guided it from Earth for over nine years every day culminating in its closest approach to Pluto on July 14, 2015. 
and it has already and will continue to send back pictures, to beam back pictures of Pluto and God knows what else, the likes of which we have never, ever seen or been exposed to in the history of humankind. And as we sit here, that spacecraft has been heading farther and deeper into space to discover more of the world out there. It goes about a million miles a day. And it may go on forever, at least until some asteroid or some other space junk completely takes it out. In a world of endings, and we live in a world of endings, we long for something or someone to go on, to go on forever. We live in a world of the temporary. The only thing that does not change is change itself. And the great prophet Bob Dylan even said, there's nothing so stable as change. Is there anything that goes on forever, that is inexhaustible, that has no end? In today's story of Elijah and the widow of Zarephath, we are reminded of a God whose goodness and resources go on forever. We continue to act like God's goodness and resources will surely run out. They'll run its course. And I'm willing to bet most of us at some point in our lives have asked whether God really truly cares for us. Does God really care for me in this whole grand scheme of things? For instance, Elijah and the widow simply need water and food. In our time, the UN reports that 850 million people are hungry and malnourished. Over half of these are children. About 18,000 children die every day because of hunger and malnutrition, thirst. So wouldn't God then and now and in the future be too busy or too frustrated to care about us or even care about some traveling preacher, Elijah, and an unimportant widow who was as good as dead? When elephants fight, the grass suffers. So goes the African proverb. And the elephants in question here are two gods, Yahweh and Baal, gods competing for a nation's allegiance by means of drought and disaster. And this widow and her son were caught in this cosmic struggle between abundance and famine. And here is Elijah. He appears abruptly, out of nowhere. One minute he, you've never heard of him, and the next he's changing the scene with his brash, confident, no-nonsense, take-charge kind of manner. And in Eliza's situation, there were enormous problems. King Ahab was a notorious, wicked king. It says he did more evil in the sight of God than any other king. Then there was a three-year drought. And as a result, there was a famine, complete with dying cattle and starving people. Now, Elijah's name means Yahweh is my God. And so this man, whose very name is a glad confession of faith, will ultimately bring hope to God's people who have often been oppressed. He is going to surprise the discouraged with encouragement. And the nation is going to realize once more that God's power is available to them and that God's heart is more than willing to meet their needs, that God is invested in them. And in the town of Zarephath, there lived a widow with her only son. And God sent Elijah to her. He was not sent to the king. He wasn't sent to one of the priests. He wasn't sent to anybody of any importance, but to a person of insignificance and unimportance. The widow, she was so unimportant that we don't even know her name. She lived in a dry and desolate place. The drought had been severe. Tears probably welled up in her eyes as she gathered these sticks one by one, remembering the better times when her husband was alive, when the food was plentiful and the family was healthy. She had no fortune. She had no prospects for the future. And after gathering sticks, she would then go home, kindle a small fire, and cook a last meal for her son and herself. She knew that she would die soon. Food had run out. Time had run out. Hope had run out. And when Elijah finds her and asks her to be fed, she says that she doesn't have any sufficient food to keep her or her own son alive. And so Elijah tells her that God will not allow her supply of flour and oil to run out, saying those words we hear over and over and over and over again throughout Scripture. 
Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid because God sees your son. Do not be afraid because God, for God, there is something bigger going on and you are very much a part of it. Do not be afraid because God indeed cares about you, even though you may seem insignificant. Do not be afraid because God will meet you in your needs. And this woman did what she was asked. They went home and ate, and the food and the jugs of oil never ran out. And although still disheartened, the widow trusted Elijah enough, and God injected some life into that dire situation. But then her son dies, and she regretted her kindness to Elijah and blamed him for her son's death. And so moved by a deep faith, Elijah prays that God might restore her son so that the validity and trustworthiness of God's word might be demonstrated in her own life. And then this non-Israelite widow was granted the only hope for a widow in that society, her son's life. And the widow then made a confession that the Israelites failed to make saying to Elijah, the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. With all of its wondrous, miraculous content, this is still a very human story, filled with so many details reflecting everyday life at that ancient time. Back then, writers and poets wrote about kings and great heroes and the gods, not about widows struggling with, with famine or their own health, or their son's health. And here God's provision is played out between Elijah and the widow as they each give consolation to each other in a critical time of need. They both did something that would ultimately make a difference in each other's lives. The widow gave what she did not have, and Elijah went where he would not have otherwise gone and challenged her to lift her sights to something higher. And after all, he had just come from a place where God sent ravens every morning and evening to provide his bread and his meat, his daily bread. He never worried about God's care or provision running out. And then the hand of God reached down into this very ordinary woman's life, a struggling widow in a small town, in the midst of a famine, and picked her up from her absolute lowest point. Rufus Watson was a man who lived to be 90 years old. He was born in Texas. He was the son of former slaves. He served his country in the military. He pitched in the Negro professional baseball leagues. He made some money investing in real estate. He witnessed lynchings and spent a lifetime wondering how people commit such atrocities and still go to church and call themselves Christian. And he found comfort in the story of Elijah and the widow. And he said if his life was not proof enough, the story showed that God meets people at the bottom of the barrel. That's where God meets us. At the bottom of the barrel, he said, God meets us when we've gone so low that all we can do is look up. If, Ruf if Rufus trusted God to meet him at life's low points, if Elijah trusted God to meet him at life's low points, if God met Elijah and the widow at their lowest point, I guess we are advised to do the same, aren't we? This is a story about how God's promises fill every part of our lives. God's promises are true for every person, every situation. Nothing or no one is beyond the concern of God. But here's the kicker. God relies on us to do something about it, to be the vessels, to be the instruments of that provision. God responds to human suffering and responds with compassion and second and third and fourth chances. But how would God do that were it not through us? Like the president of International Justice Mission, Gary Haugen, said, God has a plan to help bring justice to this world, and his plan is us. There is no backup plan, he says. In 1994, at the age of 37, a man named Mike McIntyre, decided to confront his fears and the shaky path his life was taking, 
living in San Francisco at the time. He left his job, he left his girlfriend, his apartment, all the trappings of his life, and decided to hitchhike across America, heading for Cape Fear in North Carolina, a location which symbolized the fear of many things in his life. He put a few things in a backpack, but to help him with his confrontation with his, confrontation, with his fears, he left behind the one thing most of us would never leave home without. Any guesses? Money. He decided he wanted to find some kindness in America. So he took with him absolutely no cash, no credit cards, no traveler's checks, no purchasing power of any kind. Instead, he decided he would rely on the kindness of strangers. Even from them, he vowed he would not take money but he would accept food and shelter and rides and friendship. And as he worked his way across the country, he found that it was possible to do that. He made the entire journey without money. He didn't eat as often as he probably would have if he were carrying cash. Yet he received enough food to get by and was sheltered in people's homes along the way. And he stayed one night with an older woman who was caring for her brain-damaged granddaughter, yet she welcomed him too. On another occasion, he found a sense of family with a family on, South, on a South Dakota ranch. A woman with a tear-shaped tattoo taught him to feel at home in nature and to not fear the dark woods where he would sometimes sleep. Elsewhere, he was taken in by a low-income couple that gave him a tent to take with him even though it was one of their most valuable possessions. And not everyone he met along the way was kind and generous, even though there were, there were plenty of strangers with dark ulterior motives. But most people were kind. In fact, when he, had finally, when he finally arrived in Cape Fear, North Carolina, he decided that the location was misnamed. And in this book about the journey, appropriately titled The Kindness of Strangers. He writes, The name is as misplaced as my own fears. I see now that I have always been afraid of the wrong things. My great shame is not my fear of death, but my fear of life. Friend, as it turns out, our God is a God of compassion and life. And our God demonstrates this by providing for his people in ways that we might never expect, through a person we might never expect, through a community we might never expect. And who knows, any given day, you and I just might be the unexpected ones. We are Easter people. And no matter how deep our troubles, how bitter our trials, how great our needs, how low we go. God meets us at the bottom of the barrel with the power to bring resurrection to a town, to a community, to a life near you. That's the kind of power that goes on forever and ever, that can never be exhausted. And it is my hopeful prayer that this propels us to claim anew those sacred words, great is thy faithfulness, O oh God, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me.